we um, we start and end as close to on time as possible. Um, as we go through, um, please feel free to send any questions or or comments in the chat. I'll do my best to check um, check those as I go through. Um, or raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll do like, again my best to kind of watch watch for questions. Uh, but of course, at the end, we'll have time to um, to answer um, to answer any questions that you guys have. So the um, the preview tonight. So I just I want to go over a few different things. Um, first off, just a, a quick um, refresher on where we are with the makeup of the legislature, um, kind of what we're hearing, what hot topics are coming for the, that should say 2020, not 2019 <laughs> legislative preview. I just, I just fixed this and I obviously missed this slide. Um, so the, the 2020 legislative preview. Um, and then I'll, I'll walk through the kind of um, 101 on how a bill becomes a law and then where those um, critical points are where you can most influence legislators and be helpful um, during the legislative process. So again, as we move through this, feel free to ask, um, ask questions. So with the, um, the Arizona, we're in the 54th Arizona legis legislature and uh, we're about to start the second regular session. Um, and the, um, I'll start over in the Senate. So the Senate has um, a 17-13 split with 17 uh, Republicans are carrying the majority right now. <coughs> the majority leadership um, is chaired by President Karen Fan out of District 1, that is um, that Prescott area. Um, the president pro tem is Senator Far Eddie Farnsworth out of District 12, and I see um, Joe is on the call. That's uh, Joe's senator, so we can blame him for, for Eddie Farnsworth. Just kidding, Joe. <laughs> um, Majority Leader uh, Rick Gray is um, out of District uh, 21. That's the Peoria area. And then their cap leadership is capped out with their whip. Um, senator Borelli is out of District 5. That's Lake Havasu's area. Um, and then other kind of key people in the caucus that you should be aware of, um, Senator Allen in District 6 is the chair of the Senate Education uh, Committee. Her vice chair is Senator Boyer out of District 20. Um, and then uh, Vince Leach out of 11, vice chair of appropriations, and then Gowan chairs, um, chairs appropriations. Um, we might see some bills go through finance, um, tax um, related bills, tax credit related bills, things that impact funding and stuff like that. Sometimes they run through finance, vouchers have, have run through finance before. Um, so that's, that, that's why we kind of monitor those committees as well. And then over um, in the Democratic caucus, so minority leadership, um, uh, Senator Bradley out of District 10, which is Tucson area. Um, assistant Minority Leader is Lupe uh, Contreras, uh, District 19, that is over um, in Tolleson, West Valley. Um, and then the my, uh, Senate Minority Caucus has co-whips, so it's Senator Otondo and um, Senator uh, Peshlakai. Uh, Atondo is District 4, which is Yuma, um, parts of Tucson, and then Far West Valley. And then um, Senator Peshlakai is um, up on the Tribal Nations in District 7. The State House, um, their split is a little bit closer. So if you recall in 2018, the Democrats picked up four seats. So the, the makeup is now um, 31 Republicans and 29 Democrats. Um, the majority is chaired by Speaker um, Bowers. Um, his pro tem is um, Representative Shope out of District 8. Um, and then the leader, Warren Peterson, District 12. Um, and then their whip is uh, Representative Nutt yeah, out of District 14. Um, House Minority Leadership, uh, Minority Leader Fernandez out of District 4. 
Um, the assistant leaders, Randy Fries, District 9, again, Tucson area. And then their co-whips are Representative Salmon and Boulding. Um, and then some key people um, over um, in, the, um, in the House, uh, Representative Udall chairs um, education and um, Representative Fillmore is her vice chair. Um, Fillmore has introduced a lot of um, a lot of crazy bills so far, everything from consolidation to things related to um, uh, gender pronouns and, and restricting um, you know, what we can call students and stuff like that. So it, um, there, I'll kind of go through some of that <laughs> in a little bit. But that's essentially the, the, where we are, kind of like the lay of the land and the landscape. The, um, the split is really close and that's, that's really important and we'll get to why that matters when we kind of walk through um, how, a, uh, how a bill becomes a law and what's important, how many votes we have to count to, to, to move a bill or to stop um, a bad piece of legislation. So for AEA, we have um, our, our number one priority for us is going to be um, to continue uh, to kind of pound the drum on, on public education funding. That's gonna, that is AEA's paramount issue. Um, we'll continue to talk about the need for a, um, a new uh, dedicated revenue source um and and a need to kind of stop the gimmicks on on funding um so that that will definitely continue to be the the paramount issue there are other things that we're looking at um as far as other prior obviously other priorities in our agenda um and if you get the legislative update you'll see our our um the board approved our, our 2020 legislative and policy agenda. So you'll see all kind of like the detailed outlines in that. We'll make sure to send it out after, um, after the webinar as well, if you haven't seen it already. Um, but minimizing the impact of standardized tests. Um, there's an, uh, a proposal that's floating right now um, that would tie um, opportunity funding or essentially funding for low-income uh, students, which is a, a, a concept that we support. You know, we know that it costs more money to educate students in low-income communities uh, or coming from low-income backgrounds. Um, and so a poverty weight or an opportunity weight, um, if you will, um, is definitely needed and necessary. Unfortunately, um, the group that's proposing this is also tying that money to student growth on um, the state assessment. Um, and so that is where the kind of, um, for us, the rubber hits the road and, and there's an issue there because we don't want to see money, um, standardized tests being tied to money. Um, and so we, uh, as you all know, strongly oppose results-based funding for that very reason um, for the last couple of sessions and we'll continue to do so. And so even though this concept um, has a, um, has a, it, it's coming from a good place of, of supporting low income students. The, the, the kind of the idea that it's tied to uh, performance on a test score, um, the money is tied to performance on a test score is, is not good, um, for us. So that's one that we'll, we'll definitely continue to watch as it, as it moves through. Um, but minimizing the impact of standardized tests is a priority for us. Um, charter school accountability ha has been um, an issue that we've really kind of um, raised the bar for the last couple of sessions um, and with the help of um, Craig Harris from the Arizona Republic on exposing a lot of charters for the waste, fraud, and abuse in their system um, have been able to um, kind of get some traction and, and media attention around the issue. Um, getting some real reforms has been the difficult part with this legislature and with this majority um, leadership and, and governor. Uh, but um, uh, Senator Quesada in the, um, with the Senate Democrats will continue to introduce a package of, of charter school accountability bills 
um, that we will um, continue to support. Whether or not they move or get a hearing is a different story, but of course this is an issue that we will continue to, to talk about and to highlight as important. Um, and then finally, community schools, the need to um, really look at our, our schools as a place of support for students and the families that they're serving um, and getting uh, some investment in, in those models is another um, priority for AEA. Um, some threats that we are uh, hearing, um, we haven't seen anything yet, but you know, we saw it last year early on, um, attacks on Red for Ed, uh, free speech, those kinds of things that could potentially come back in some way, shape or form. So we'll be watching for that closely. Um, there's a lot of talk about the state retirement system. And this is where we're gonna need members to really help us with um, a lot of education um, in the community and, and why, why your retirement security is important to you because they, it's getting, the issue is getting kind of convoluted in the conversation around pay. Um, and so the chamber has turned it into a conversation about your pension um, taking away from your paycheck um, rather than, you know, the, the fact that this is, it's valuable to um, educators to have a secure and safe retirement. Um, and it, it, um, we know NEA has, plenty, has done plenty of research and actually has, we brought them down um, last year through uh, a coalition um, to present to lawmakers on how this, how pensions help with um, recruitment and retention of educators. Um, and so we'll continue to educate, but this is, it's, kind of, it's becoming a, a very um, real threat because they're tying it to um, the, the need for um, increasing pay um, for teachers and educators. So um, we'll, we'll continue to monitor. Uh, we haven't seen any actual legislation introduced yet. Um, and hopefully we don't see any, but the conversation is definitely alive. Um, another kind of threat that's always ongoing, attacks on labor organizations. There was a, a, a lawsuit that was filed against the city of Phoenix and their um, AFSCME local for um, uh, their president's release time or like release time for uh, employees to do ask me business. Um, and so there could be something related to release time for public employees um, in legislation that, that we see coming down. Um, usually if Goldwater's behind it, um, which they are behind the lawsuit, they could potentially try you know, a, a court approach, a legislative approach, um, et cetera. So we're monitoring it um, and we are a part of a, of a labor coalition um, that, that monitors these kinds of, of threats collectively and, and fights them together. So we definitely wouldn't be alone in that, um, but it's, it's one that we're looking out for. And then uh, finally, we actually just got the bill today um, and it's being heard next Tuesday. So Senator Allen has introduced Senate Bill 1082, um, which is on comprehensive sex education. So if you recall last session, she, um, her bill was used for the repeal of the so-called no promo homo law, um, which basically there was a statute um, in uh, regards to AIDS education that, that essentially said that teachers could not promote homosexuality as a positive lifestyle choice. Um, that law, the, the um, state was sued um, and the plaintiffs won. And um, so the repeal, um, it was signed into law. The repeal of that statute was signed into law, which was a great victory uh, for the LGBTQ community last year. Um, it was done um, as an amendment onto one of Senator Allen's bills, um, and she was not very happy about that. And so now she's coming back uh, with a vengeance on sex education 
um, and has introduced, um, I haven't read the bill in full disclosure, um, but the texts I got all afternoon were, it's pretty egregious. Um, so we can, it'll probably be a circus on Tuesday's um, hearing with people testifying um, in support of this, of this uh, legislation. Um, so um, whether or not that is something that actually moves um, is yet to be yet to be determined. Um, I think we can we can probably stop it um, and have a would we'll, we'll, we'll have enough votes uh, in the Republican caucus to hopefully, you know, if it, if she, obviously she's going to give it a hearing um, and she can have her make her show do her do her thing and then just put the thing away and let it go away quietly that after that um, or loudly, I guess. Um, but, but that's definitely one of the things that we'll be watching for uh, throughout the, the legislature, because as you know, things could come back um, at any time um, while they're in session. Um, and there's several other bills that have been introduced um, that we would be uh, monitoring and and watching as they're moving through. Um, uh, some have some have been introduced. Others we've just kind of been um, talked to, but they haven't dropped yet. Um, there's a, a the state board of education um, introduced a, a educator discipline um, bill. Uh, this is related to. Um, there was a, a number of stories uh, last summer about kind of like the loopholes around um, individuals uh, staying within the profession that had either allegations of misconduct with um, students uh, but weren't criminally prosecuted um, and they were able to stay as non-certified either, you know, coaches, teachers in charter schools, things like that. Um, so non-certified um, professionals um, were staying in the classroom, even though they had a history of, of um, misconduct. And so this bill essentially creates um, a way for the Department of Education to monitor all employees um, that require a fingerprint um, clearance card um, to work in, um, in public schools. Um, so that's, that's that bill. Um, the student discipline bill has come from the um, ACLU. Um, this one, it has to do with um, the issue around disproportionately uh, communities of color, low income communities, essentially, um, and disproportionate discipline in those communities. Um, and so the, it calls for a requirement to report um, or to publish uh, a, a report. Uh, the Department of Education would have to publish the report um, of all of the discipline referrals um, in a school and in, in a district. Um, and then it puts some limitations on, you know, out of school suspensions, expulsions and things like that. Um, and just on these, AEA does not have positions on these bills, so um, we haven't taken a, an official position. I, again, this is for, for your information. Um, so um, you, you will essentially eventually know if we do, if we end up signing in on a bill. But as of right now, I'm just giving you information on, on all of these issues. Um, school consolidation, though, I can tell you that we've been opposed to in the past. Um, that has come back. Um, uh, Representative Fillmore um, has introduced it again. There is going to be legislation around uh, student use uh, and vaping products in schools, um, kind of promoting to marketing to youth. Um, Senator Quesada introduced a bill uh, that would make it uh, legal to have a billboard um, uh, that promotes a vaping product, um, a tobacco or a vaping product um, within like 100 feet of a school, for example. Um, so things like that will, will come up. The Juul lawsuit, um, a lot of that is kind of uh, stirring up um, uh, the, the vaping bills. 
Um, there's going to be another vaccination bill. Um, uh, there, that kind of came down last year where parent, parents that were anti-vaccines uh, um, had a big presence at the Capitol. I think Senator Boyer was the one that introduced it last time. Um, it didn't move, but um, where I, my understanding is that that's probably coming back. Um, and this is again so that students wouldn't have to get vaccines or though, or and I think right now they still can. Um, op, parents can opt out or submit a, a, a disclosure form to to a school. Um, but there's they want more flexibility, that, and that's kind of essentially the background there. Um, and then the other, the last one is uh, related to uh, Proposition 301. Um, there was a bill that was introduced by, um, it was co-sponsored by Senator Allen and Senator Brophy McGee. And this is the related to Proposition 301. Um, so this is essentially restructuring how the, the um, uh, the funds from the um, uh, from the the revenue, the 0.6 is distributed. Um, so it changes it to have 75% of the revenue uh, go into the classroom site fund. It also gets rid of the um, like performance based pay and those buckets and it essentially just funds the menu of um, of options. So districts could spend on pay, they could spend on class size reduction, school safety. Um, I'm going off the top of my head here, but there's a list of like 10 or 11 items in that um, on that menu now that they've expanded um, and the district can now um, choose um, how they how they spend their money. So it does kind of get rid of some of that red tape that is currently associated with um, with 301 and the classroom site fund there. Um, and then the, the remaining 25%, so 20% would go to universities and then 5% would go to um, the um, uh, community colleges. So the universities currently get research and development money uh, and the community colleges get workforce uh, funds out of that. Um, so the we are expecting to see a referendum kind of associated with this bill that would raise the revenue to a full penny. So currently Proposition 301 is a 0.6 sales tax. The increase would add an additional 0.4 around an additional $500 million in revenue. Um, it, was, it came out today though that if the referendum doesn't pass, the reforms to 301 could still stand alone. And so getting rid of that red tape, um, you know, could could potentially be, a, looks like a good thing um, for schools um, to give some flexibility, get rid of that performance-based pay, performance pay in those buckets. Um, and uh, that, you know, kind of that's, that's essentially where, where it's at right now. But it, it looks like they're going to try and introduce both the um, the 301 bill and and also a referendum. Okay, so I'm going to check to see if there are any questions, and then I'm also going to check on time. All right. Okay, so I'm going to keep on going. So I'm going to move through um, the next uh, section pretty quickly. Um, but again, if you have questions, stop me. So we'll walk through how just kind of the, the legislative process. So again, there's the legislative branch and the executive branch. So there are 30 senators, 60 representatives, and then obviously our one governor. Um, and so for a bill to become a law in the Senate, we need 16 votes. We need 31 votes in the House and then the governor to either sign uh, to sign the bill or to let it um, to let it just um, move into law without him giving it a veto. So again, if you recall, when I said that the the Republicans in the House have 31 votes, it's that's why it's so important 
um, because the, the partisan split is so close, um, you know, these things matter. In the Senate, they have 17 votes and, and in the House, they have 31 votes. So if they lose members on an issue, an issue that's controversial or things like that, um, it, it's easy for something to essentially die um, because, because the, the partisan split is, is so close. So a second way for a bill to become a law is through the referendum process. So I mentioned this in the, in the 301 uh, bills. Um, so the 301, um, so for that to happen, excuse me, you need 16 votes in the Senate, again, 31 votes in the House, but you don't need the governor's signature. So instead, the um, legislation then goes out for a, um, a vote, um, by it goes out for popular vote so by election so at the general election in november voters um, take an up or down vote on the issue and decide uh, whether or not to to approve um, the referendum or to or to fail it um, so essentially if you recall um, the voucher expansion um, that was also done as a referendum um, and obviously it, it failed um, at the, it was a no vote for us, so it failed. Um, voters did not approve the governor's um, voucher expansion. And then the final way, so in Arizona, our constitution allows us to have a citizen's initiative um, and the citizen's initiative kind of removes the, um, the legislature and the governor um, entirely. And so that, is where we as citizens have the right to propose and petition to have measures put on the ballot and then vote have voters vote on them um, you know again in the general election um, this was what we did with invest in ed um, in 2018 when everyone was out uh, pounding the pavement collecting signatures um, that was the citizens initiative and it, it is a process that we have here in arizona not every state has this um, this process so it's definitely something that we value um, unfortunately the legislature every year makes it more and more difficult um, to to have um, the citizens initiative process if you recall the um, when we were collecting signatures you had to stay within the lines and all of these really tight criteria it's all legislation that's been introduced to kind of tighten the reins on the citizens initiative because the majority um, currently does not like that that we have the right to to um, to the initiative process. Um, and then so i'll walk through the legislative uh, the legislative process so there's several steps that have to happen. Um, in each uh, chamber. So a bill has to be introduced, and I referenced Senator Allen's uh, Bill 1082. So this is it, it was introduced today. Um, so 1082, sex education. So this is what a bill, kind of like the cover sheet, what it looks like when it's um, pre-filed and introduced. And then it's assigned to a, um, a committee hearing. So this uh, bill you see um, is assigned to January 14th, two o'clock, um, Senate Education Committee, she's going to hear her um, sex education bill. Um, that uh, from, from a, this is just kind of what a, um, the Senate Education Committee looks like. This was from a few years ago, but the chair right there in the middle is, was still Sylvia Allen and she's still the chair today. Um, so they um, convene the education committee or the or or any committee hearing is where the public has the right to um, to testify so this is where um, you can come in and provide um, your testimony why you support or oppose a legislation it's where i go and testify on behalf of aea why we support or oppose um, a um, piece of legislation so this is a really important step in the process because it's where the public um, is allowed to kind of engage um, the lawmakers. It's also an opportunity for lawmakers to amend a piece of legislation. So 
if you're if you introduce a bill and and you know it's form but you know it's not done or you have other things that you um, are working on um you have um and i see some questions coming in but i will let me get back to you guys on that sorry i just saw them um so this is where you have um, the opportunity to amend. So you introduce the bill, but you know that it needs some work or you need to tighten some language. So you can offer an, an amendment um, at the committee hearing. Um, oftentimes when a bill is introduced, um, the, the first reading is done on the floor and then the bill is assigned by the president, Senate president or the speaker to a committee. Um, if the speaker or the president assign it to multiple committees, it's usually a sign that they don't really like the bill. Um, unless it's a, a bill that is tied to funding, usually that if it's a, like an education bill that also has dollars tied to it, for example, a special education bill with a $10 million appropriation, um, it'll, it could potentially be assigned to Senate education and appropriations, um, and it and then it has to move. You know, it would have to move through both committees um, before it can move uh, continue moving through the process. But sometimes these bills are are on um, multiple committees, like five or six or seven committees, and that's when you know that leadership really doesn't like your bill. So after committee, um, it then um, every single bill has to go through rules. So House and Senate rules are very powerful committees because they, um, like I say, they have to hear every single bill. They determine the constitutionality of a bill. Um, and so it, before a bill can move out um, to caucus and to the floor, it has to go through rules. So the chairman of House um, Rules is um, Representative Kern, and um, I believe Fan chairs um, Senate Rules. And so that is those people in those chair positions are are uh, um, carry some some pretty heavy weight. Um, after rules, it goes to caucus. So caucus is an opportunity for the um, Democrats and the Republicans to kind of have team huddles. And this is where they, um, they kind of talk to each other. There's a, a small picture down here on the right of a House Democratic Caucus. Um, it's an opportunity for the entire caucus to be briefed on um, all of the bills that are going to be on the floor calendars. Um, so, you know, I might be assigned to house um, education and house health care, but I, you know, I didn't hear all of the bills that were on ways and means and um, appropriations. So I want to, I'm going to go to caucus to hear from my colleagues that are on those committees um, to get some background on why they voted the way they did, what the context is for the bill, have any of my questions answered from staff, et cetera. So that's, that's essentially what caucus is for. It's really to kind of get a lay of what we're about to vote on on the floor, uh, what the background is. If I have any questions, I can get them answered and uh, stuff like that. So all of these are open to the public, but the public cannot testify um, or provide comment in these, um, in these spaces, in rules or in um, caucus. And then you have um, the committee of the whole. So committee of the whole is um, another opportunity for um, discussion and debate, uh, but it's another opportunity for amendments. So you can amend a bill either in committee or in cow. Um, so that's that's why this is a critical step in the process. If you get the bill out of committee, but it still needs work or there's still issues or you run into issues with it, you can offer another amendment on the floor. And then it goes to a third read 
calendar and a third read vote. And this is when you have the vote that goes up on the floor. So once it's third read out of the chamber of origin, then the bill is transmitted to the opposite chamber. So if I start out as a house bill, I move through the entire process in the house, I'm third read out of the house, and then I'm transmitted over to the Senate and I start the process all over again in the Senate. So I have to be first read and get all the way to third read and a third read vote in the, um, in the Senate uh, before I can go to the governor's desk. The other way kind of to speed up the process that we see is um, mirror bills are introduced. So where um, a house member and a Senate member kind of coordinate and they introduce identical bills in both chambers. They move the bills at the same time. Um, and then they are, um, they essentially come out at the same time and go to the governor's desk. Um, so that kind of speeds up the process. That's essentially what we did um, last year with the um, uh, structured English uh, immersion uh, reform bill that was signed by the governor on Valentine's Day last year, which is pretty early in the process, but it's because uh, two identical bills were introduced in both chambers by Ms. Udall and Mr. Boyer, um, and so they moved pre uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then the final thing that I'll flag that um, we watch for, and this kind of happens more towards the end of session when it's really crazy, is things called strike everything amendments. So a strike everything amendment is, um, can be pretty dangerous because um, it, a, a member can take an education bill and make it an immigration bill or flip flop. They can make an immigration bill, um, an education bill. Um, and so it's essentially taking a, um, a bill and striking everything on, uh, on that bill and, and putting a fresh new um, bill on top of it. Um, so we call those strikers um, and they pop up at the last minute. Um, and sometimes they have things that are, um, are reckless or you know, that we don't approve of. And so we, we have to monitor those uh, pretty closely. So that is that. And I think a couple questions came in. Let me, whoops. Sorry. It, it's going to be easier for me if I could just um, answer questions at the end. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like trying to do two things. So let me just get through this last section. Um, and then I will, um, I will answer questions afterwards. Um, okay. So preparing to lobby. Um, I just want, um, when you go in there, just remember legislators, lawmakers are people too. And at the end of the day, you're the education expert in the room. A lot of these folks don't have a background in education and they're looking for folks that have the background and expertise in different areas because education is just one issue that they are brought, um, forward with, um, people talk to them about multiple issues, hundreds of different issues. And so um, just remember that when you are, um, when you're talking to them, ultimately you're the, you're the practitioner, you're the one that's been in the classroom on the ground doing the work. Um, and at the same time, making sure that we keep our message clear and concise and simple. Um, the most effective way uh, to lobby members that I've seen is to share your personal story, why you're committed to the work that you do, why you're passionate about the work that you do. Um, that is always the most um, effective way to move a member, to influence members. Um, they want to hear, um, they want to hear from you all on your, your, your personal story, your personal commitment to, to the profession. Um, if you have a, a one pager a document that, that you um, prepare or leave behind, that's always helpful. Contact information is always helpful to leave um, with lawmakers. Um, there's multiple ways to lobby the members. You can send them emails, phone calls, um, and text messages if they allow that, um, if you have that kind of a relationship with a member. 
Um, you can lobby them in person, set up meetings with them, um, have back home meetings, um, or like I mentioned earlier, provide testimony and committee. Um, and then you can lobby from home uh, via the request to speak system. So via email, um, lobbying via email is easy and it's convenient, but the success rate varies here. So it's not um, always the most effective because they get hundreds and hundreds of, of emails um, on a daily basis. Um, but at the same time, you know, if they're getting 500 emails on a single bill, um, this sex education bill or a voucher bill, for example, that those things kind of matter because then they have their staff uh, kind of tracking the, the quantity of those emails. Um, but in order to make your email as effective as possible, um, identify yourself at, in the subject line. And I would encourage you to, to kind of call out that you are um, either a voter in their district, a, con a constituent in their district, or if you're an educator in their district. Um, and then when you're writing out your message, always personalize it. So sometimes we send out like an alert, an action alert, and we ask you to email your lawmaker. Um, so, you know, those are our standard emails. I know it's easy, it's fast, but if you, if you take time to personalize that message, it, um, it's uh, more effective and it goes a long way there. Um, we have a handout. You can find the legislators phone numbers on the website and I'll do a quick overview of the of the website at the end here. Um, so you can find their, their phone numbers or contact information online. We also have a document that we provide. Um, so work with your OC uh, to get those distributed um, in your locals. Uh, it's called influencing your law, um, influencing your, your, your decision makers, influencing your decision makers, um, where we have the um, kind of member roster, and then we have um, the how a bill becomes a law. Um, our graphic designer did a really great graphic for us. Um, so that's in there. Um, and the breakdown of what school districts are and what LDs are in this document. So it's very helpful. Um, but if you do call your lawmaker, be kind to the assistant, be nice to them when scheduling. Um, if you're going to talk and leave a voicemail, be clear and concise in that message. Always identify yourself. Um, identify yourself as a constituent in the in the specific district or what school district you work at. If you're calling about a specific bill, name that bill in the message. So House Bill XXX or, or Senate Bill such and such. Um, and then, of course, always leave a phone number for them to give you a call back. Um, so if you're going to meet your lawmaker on um, in person, the legislature is in session Monday through Thursdays. Um, and again, we start on next Monday, January 13th. They are back home usually on Fridays. So if you, um, if you would like to invite your uh, legislator to a meeting, invite them to your classroom, um, you can do have some of those back home meetings. Um, I would encourage you if you are planning to come down to the Capitol and to set up a meeting with your legislate, legislator that you do it well in advance. Calendars are really busy um, and be flexible with scheduling as flexible as you can be um, because their calendars can be really busy and hectic during session. Um, lobbying in committee. So the request to speak system is how you log in um, to, um, and we have a video link on our, on, uh, on our website, how to navigate the request to speak system. But you log in to the request to speak system, and that is how you kind of line yourself up to testify in committee. Um, in there, you can check whether or not you want to provide testimony. So if you're just going to sign in the RTS to say, I oppose this bill, um, you can, you know, select the thumbs down, but you don't have to testify. You can just check 
it, it says there like, do you want to testify and you can just check the no box. Uh, but if you do that kind of puts you in the queue uh, to provide testimony in committee. So it is um, kind of formal procedure. You always want to identify yourself and um, the protocol is to speak through the chair. Um, so, for example, um, if I'm in front of Senate Education Committee, I'm going to say, you know, good afternoon, Madam Chair um, and members. My name is Stephanie Parra, for the record. I'm here representing the Arizona Education Association. I'm here to speak um, in support of X bill or in opposition to X bill, and this is why. Um, and then be very direct. Um, I always say be direct, be brief, be brilliant, share a, 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 a personal um, impacts, um, how, how the uh, proposal will personally impact you is always really effective. Um, but being direct, being brief, being concise, um, especially if there's a long list of folks waiting to speak on a bill is, um, is helpful. Um, and then the, I, I mentioned this already, so you can lobby from home, you can uh, go online and review committee agendas, submit your request to speak um, positions. We really want to encourage members, if you don't have an RTS account to get one, um, it's really important for as, as much as it might not seem like it's important, I've had lawmakers tell me that while they're sitting on the floor, they review the request to speak and kind of see how many, if there are you know, hundreds of people in opposition to a bill, it's gonna raise, uh, give them some pause and raise some concern. Um, and so I really encourage members to sign in um, and to sign up if you don't already have one. Um, again, we'll, we'll make sure that after this, we'll send the link out so that you know how to navigate that uh, website and that you know how to um, get, on, uh, get on the request to speak. Um, but that is, it's, it is very helpful. And, and as we move through the session, we'll definitely do action alerts and stuff like that. And part of the action alert would call for you to sign in either in support or in opposition to, um, to a bill. All right. So um, just a, a couple of things on, you know, what you should know if you're going to go down there. If you're going down there as a team, give yourself plenty of time um, to get down there. So if you have an appointment at four o'clock, give yourself plenty of time once you leave school to get down there, find parking. Parking can be very tricky, especially if there is a lobby day for a big um, organization. Um, that uh, that is always um, that's always tricky. So give yourself plenty of time. If you're going to the house, you have security in the house that you have to consider as well and line up for. Um, and make sure that you um, that you as a team have time to kind of connect with each other before you go in. Know who's going to share what. So if I'm go you know I'm going in with. Um, with, uh, I'm just gonna, I'm, I think Marisol is on, I'm gonna say Marisol and I are going into a meeting together and she's gonna come in as, you know, I, I can speak to the specific issues about the bill, but Marisol is gonna speak to how this impacts her as a, in the classroom as, a, as an educator, uh, for example. So those, that's kind of like the strategy um, going in. So you kind of wanna talk to each other about like, what, what are you going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? And then who, who's gonna take notes for us, right? Like in that meeting, I would be the note taker. I would make sure that whatever follow-up needs to happen, we, we make sure that, that we do that. Um, and then finally, um, be polite. Um, I can't stress this enough. You're gonna run into lawmakers that are rude and disrespectful, um, but we all, you know, we're there representing AEA. We wanna make sure that we um, represent the organization in the best way possible. So always be polite, um, but be confident in what you're saying, because again, you know, um, you know what's best for your students, you know what's best for you as an educator. Um, so be confident, but always be, be polite when you're, when you're down there. 
Um, and then flexibility, again, I mentioned their schedules can be crazy. So just being flexible with appointment times um, and knowing that you may have had a four o'clock appointment, but it might not happen until 4.30, um, you know, because the, the lawmaker is running behind on meetings or, or whatnot, that could always happen. Um, and then just some, some general tips. And I know we're coming up on time and I want to get to those questions. Um, some, gem, some general tips. So again, be punctual, introduce yourself. If you're there, um, if you have, uh, lawmakers want to hear ideas. So if you have ideas, if you have solutions that you want to bring forward, um, talk to them about uh, being solution focused. Uh, again, I can't stress enough, stress enough that sharing your personal story is, um, is most impactful. And definitely show your passion for this work. That matters. They really want to hear um, they want to hear why you're committed, why you're, you know, why are you taking time out of your very busy schedules to be down there talking to them um, so that they hear directly from you. Um, I said this earlier, treat everyone with respect. Don't get in a fight with lawmakers. Um, we're there to be professionals and, and, and to be courteous. Even, even the most disrespectful ones just you know, smile and wave and walk away. <laughs> I've had to do it plenty of times. It's uh, it, it's tough sometimes, but we we have to be, you know, be the bigger people. Um, be sure to say thank you. Um, thanking your lawmaker for for a meeting with you, um, whether it's sending them a follow up email, a handwritten thank you note, things like that. And then finally, I just want to remind everybody there's definitely no permanent friends and no permanent enemies at the Capitol. I have um, found allies in some of the most conservative members at times. Some have carried bills for us. And then, you know, some of our friends have voted against us on certain issues. Um, so no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. We always have to keep that in mind when we're down there. Um, and you never know when you're going to agree with somebody or, and you never know when you're going to disagree with somebody. So it's just, it's the, the name of the game. We can't take this uh, too personal. All right. I'm going to, um, given time, I'm going to get to these questions. Um, Nicole Kozad, yes, the, um, the Senate does not have the metal detectors getting through. Um, uh, so Judy's asking about why the House. So the House actually, it was a few years back, I think it was when um, it was kind of representative then, or Speaker Gowan at the time, he's now in the Senate, it was kind of like a parting gift. Um, was that security system and those um, those uh, um, metal detectors? So um, let me see. Oh, I just closed out of the questions. I'm trying to see if I can. Um, okay. Okay, let me see. Sorry, it's hard for me to kind of go back and read everything. So if you have a question around the 301 proposal, do you want to um, unmute? It might be easier to just unmute. If anybody had a specific question, otherwise I'll... I'll keep moving. Yeah, Stephanie, it's Matt Chuck. Um, I asked a question about it. Um, I was just wondering if the 301 reform is something that we are wanting to support or need right now, because I know, especially mm -hmm. in our district in Glendale, um, we have a surplus, and I believe it's Fund 12, because I think they were afraid it was going to go away before it got passed into law. Um, last year and extending it for another 20 years. Mm -hmm. So is that something that we want to support or is this, I, I, do we need a more specific language on it? 
Yeah, at this time, we um, we don't have a position on it. Um, we are kind of still, I think right now, I, I spoke with other um, the other um, education lobbyists, we're still kind of getting more information on the actual uh, bill itself. Um, so we don't have an official position on it. Their, um, Senator Allen and Senator Brophy McGee are promoting it as removing the, um, the red tape associated with 301. So the different buckets, so the 40%, removing the 40% for performance-based pay, um, the 20% that goes to the base, so, and, and really focusing on the menu um, and, and putting all, all of the money into that, that menu. Um, and so that is the, um, that's essentially what they are, are proposing, but we don't have an official uh, position yet. Uh, you'll definitely hear from us if that changes, um, but right now, I think it's too early. It just, the bill was just introduced yesterday. So we still have a lot of questions that, that need to be answered. Okay. All right. Okay. So I am, I'm actually going to, given that we're short on time, I'm going to skip through this because we do have a recorded video that navigates through the website. Um, so I'll make sure that that's linked and when we send materials out to you guys um, that you're able to navigate that. Um, I just do want to, the last thing I want to uh, give is some important um, legislative deadlines here. So I mentioned that opening day and the legislature um, kind of convenes on, on January 13th, which is next Monday. This is where the governor will do his state of the state address. Um, we'll hear in that speech kind of what his key priorities will be, but it won't be until um, Friday of next week where we get briefed on um, and get a copy of, of the executive budget. Um, and that so that would be released. Um, uh, the other kind of big dates that we have um, would be uh, in March. So our um, spring break at the Capitol, the first, uh, we have two. So March 10th and March 17th. So whenever you have your spring break, um, you know, we want to have a big presence down there for those uh, couple of days. We are looking at doing a couple things. Um, President's Day, we are in session and you all are out of school. So we're looking at doing a President's Day at the Capitol. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then I believe if there's anybody on from Tucson, I believe Tucson has, um, they don't, they have to work President's Day, but they have rodeo day off. And my understanding is that that is um, the 20th of February. Um, and so they, um, Tucson might do a rodeo day at the Capitol. So we're still kind of working out whether or not that's going to happen. Uh, but those are um, a couple of, of uh, dates that I wanted to make sure that you guys have. Um, but we, you know, we are hearing that this could be a quick, um, a quick legislative session, uh, but you never know. They had us there through Memorial Day last year, um, you know, but they, they are eager, it's an election year, they're eager to get out on the campaign trail. Um, so we're hearing that we could be done um, as early as Easter weekend um, or by Easter weekend. So we'll see how that goes, but you know, definitely if you um, uh, can encourage members to sign up if they haven't for the legislative update, um, we, we will be keeping you informed there. I'll be, I'll start doing the live uh, videos on Fridays um, again to just kind of recap the week and, and share folks um, the, on Facebook Live. Uh, but the legislative update will, will also be another way that we communicate with, with folks and share information out. Um, anything else? Any other Rodeo dates, correct. Awesome. Okay, cool. All right. Well, hey, thank you guys. If there's, yes, Nicole did point out March 17th is presidential preference election for Dems. It is, um, and we, we did consider that, but it is also when Senate Education Committee meets. 
Um, and given that a majority of Arizonans vote uh, by mail, we thought that it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be that big of an issue. Um, um, so if if we have to change the date, we will. But um, as of right now, we'll hold the 17th um, because of Senate Education Committee. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, <laughs> Nicole. Thank you guys so much. And I hope everybody has a, a great evening. Um, if you have any questions, um, don't uh, hesitate to reach out uh, to me. Um, that's my desk line and my, and my email. Thank you guys. Have a good night.